Rav Cook, Selected Letters, Chapter 2, on the topic of Torah and Science, Letter Number 2. The second of the three letters to Rav Moshe Seidel deals with apparent contradictions between Judaism and modern theories of history and anthropology. Sorry. Rav Cook also outlines the proper approach for dealing with all seeming contradictions between the Torah and modern knowledge. By the grace of God, the holy city of Jaffa may be built and established established 5 ER 5668. This is 6th of May 1908. My close friend, a complete scholar, a treasury of Torah and pure awe of God, Rav Moshe Seidel, may you live a long and good life. Amen. Peace and blessing. I was delighted with your precious words, which reached me so long ago, but my dear friend, I did not find the necessary time to again find delight in answering your words of peace and truth. Even now I am besieged with responsibilities and my mind is distracted, but nonetheless I mean to overcome the hindrances and write a little with the help of God, blessed be he. I necessarily find myself obligated to awaken your pure spirit in regard to the theories that have emerged from new research, which for the most part contradicts the literal meaning of the Torah. My opinion on this is that anyone with common sense should know that although there is no necessary truth in all these new theories, at any rate, we are not in the least bit obligated to decisively refute and oppose them, because the Torah's primary objective is not to tell us simple facts and events of the past. What is the most what is most important is the Torah's interior, the inner meaning of the subjects, and this message will become greater still in places where there is a counterforce, which motivates us to become strengthened by it. <coughs> The gist of this has already been recorded in the words of our Rishonim, headed by the Guide for the Perplexed. A footnote: This is Maimonides devotes, uh, sorry, Maimonides devotes a major portion of the first 49 chapters of the first part of the Guide to explaining biblical terms ascribing human characteristics and form to God. Maimonides argues that these terms have an allegorical meaning when applied to God. Many Rishonim, the great legal authorities of the Middle Ages, including Yosef Albo, Yehuda Halevi and others, interpret the story of the Garden of Eden allegorically. Back to the text. And today we are ready to expand more on these matters. It makes no difference for us if in truth there was in the world an actual Garden of Eden, during which man delighted in an abundance of physical and spiritual good, or if actual existence began from the bottom upwards, from the lowest level of being towards its highest, an upward movement. We only have to know that there is a real possibility that even if a man has risen to a high level and has been deserving of all honours and pleasures, if he corrupts his ways, he can lose all that he has and bring harm to himself and to his descendants for many generations, and that this is the lesson we learn from the story of Adam's existence in the Garden of Eden, his sin and expulsion. And the master of all souls knows just how deeply this lesson should be impressed in people's hearts in order that they may avoid sin and according to this depth were the the exact number of letters written in the true Torah. When we accept this view, we no longer have any particular need to fight against the descriptions that have gained fame among the new researchers and having become unbiased in the matter, we will be able to judge fairly and now we will be able to refute peacefully their conclusions as much as truth will show us its way. The primary glory of our lives is the truth of the inseparability of the unity in its highest exaltation and eternal magnificence on the one hand and eternal righteousness on the other hand. It is only through this, the soul of the Torah, that we can glimpse her body and garments. A large footnote now. Footnote now. Said Rav Shimon, Alas, for man who regards the Torah as a book of mere tales and everyday matters, if that was so, we, even we, could compose a Torah dealing with everyday affairs and of even greater excellence. Nay, even the princes of the world possess books of greater worth, which we could use as a model for composing some such Torah. The Torah, however, contains in all its words supernal truths and sublime mysteries. The Torah that created the angel, that created all the worlds and is the means by which these are sustained, had the Torah not clothed itself in garments of this world and the world... Sorry, not clothed herself in garments of this world, the world could not endure it. The stories of the Torah are thus only her outer garments, and whoever looks upon these garments as being the Torah itself, woe to that man, for he will have no portion in the next world.
observe this. The garments worn by a man are the most visible part of him, and senseless people looking at the man do not see more in him than the garments. But in truth, the pride of the garment is the body of man, and the pride of the body is the soul. Similarly, the Torah has a body made up of the mitzvot of the Torah, called guf Torah, or gufe Torah, bodies, main principles of the Torah. And the body is enveloped in garments made up of worldly narrations. The senseless people only see the garment, the minerations. Those who are somewhat wiser penetrate as far as the body, but the really wise, the servants of the Most High King, those who stood on Har Sinai, penetrate right through to the soul, the root principle of all, namely, to the real Torah. In the future the same are destined to penetrate even to the supra-soul, the soul of the soul of the Torah. Woe to the sinners who consider the Torah to be mere worldly tales, who only see its outer garments, Happy are the righteous who fix their gaze on the Torah proper. Wine cannot be kept safe in, safe in a jar, so the Torah needs an outer garment. These are the stories and narratives, but it behooves us to penetrate beneath them. That's from the Zohar, Part 3, 152a and b. Back to, the <clears throat> back to the text. In general, the idea of gradual evolution is also only in its beginning. And there is no doubt that it will change its form and give birth to conceptions that will also include sudden leaps to complete the picture of nature. A footnote, sudden leaps, the sudden emergence of a new, of a new species without needing of missing links. And then the light of Israel will be understood in its very clarity. Back in the text. The world, res world researchers and those in Israel who follow in their footsteps Look at the Bible according to the Christian interpretation, which results in an imprisoned world. Uh, footnote says that this is the Christian concept of original sin. Back to the text. The pure understanding of life's joy and light that is in the Torah is actually found in the secure guarantee of the past. When man was very happy and only an incident of sin distanced him from his way, it is clear that any incidental failure is certain to be corrected and that man will return to his proper level forever. But if we accept the idea of evolution without any support from the past, we will always be under the threat that the process will stop in the middle of its path or that the world re will regress. Since we have no secure source to say that happiness is the, pure na is, the, sorry, is the permanent nature of man, even of essential man, the spirit, let alone for physical man as he is, body and soul together. Thus it is only Adam's experience in the Garden of Eden, Eden that attests for us a bright world and consequently it is fitting for it to be realistically and historically true, even though it is not essential to our belief. And in general, this is an important rule in the struggle of ideas. We should not immediately refute any idea which comes to contradict anything in the Torah, but rather we should build the, place, the palace of Torah above it. In so doing, we are exalted by the Torah, and through this exaltation, the ideas are revealed. And thereafter, when we are not pressured by anything, we can confidently also struggle against it. There are many, there are many illustrations to prove, to prove this, but it is difficult for me to elaborate, and a brief word is sufficient to someone as wise as you, to know how to raise the banner in the name of God, above the blowing winds, and to use everything to our true benefit, which is also for the benefit of all. And on the matter of the subjects you have chosen to study at university, may God enable you to succeed and may he shine on you from the light of his wisdom and from his abundant benevolent beauty. And may you deserve to become of those who, of those who sanctify his name. Blessed be he in his world and may you be a glory to Israel to strengthen stumbling knees with a true love of Torah and a true awe of heaven. And it is so necessary for our generation to be supported by all those having a straight heart and, and true spirit. I will conclude with a blessing and much love, as befitting your refined soul and a steadfast friend who seeks your whole perfection with much love. Humbly yours, Avraham Yitzhak Hakohen Cook. Uh, this is uh, a postscript. My father, my master, my guide and teacher, may he live a long and good life. Amen. Ask me to add that this letter was written in the midst of many matters and distractions which do not allow leisurely contemplation and he was not able to write, explain and be as well organized as he wished, which, which he regrets. Signed by Tzvi Yehuda Cook, Igrot 134.